Dear all, welcome to Dynamite Library Talks. At today's talk, we are hosting three distinguished speakers, Fatini Kondili, Benjamin Anderson, and Nikos Kontayanis. Today's talk is based on the book, The Byzantine Neighborhood, Urban Space and Political Action, published in 2021 from Routledge. In this talk, the editors of the book, Fatini Kondili and Benjamin Anderson, will give an overview of the volume and discuss is its arguments. At this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Fotini Kondili is Associate Professor of Byzantine Art and Archaeology at the University of Virginia. Her research interests include Byzantine and Frankish spatial practices, community building processes, and the material culture of non-elites. She also works on cultural, economic, and political networks in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the late Byzantine period. Her current research projects, inhibiting Byzantine Athens, deal with the city-making city processes and the role of non-elites. Benjamin Anderson is Associate Professor of the History of Art and Classics at Cornell University. He studies the visual and material cultures of the Eastern Mediterranean and the adjacent land masses, with a focus on late antique and Byzantine art and architecture. He also publishes regularly on the urban history of Constantinople and the history of archaeology. The moderator of this talk, Nikos Kontoyanis, is director of the Byzantine studies at Dumbarton Oaks. His research lies in the field of military and domestic architecture, material and visual culture, and industrial and commercial networks in the Eastern Mediterranean. His current projects focus on the study of two extensive late Byzantine hordes at the British Museum and at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And lastly, dear attendees, please bear in mind that your videos and audios are automatically closed and please, your and please type your questions in the chat section. Your questions will be answered in the Q&A session. And now I'm passing the word to Nikos Kontayanis. Thank you very much for to all our speakers and to all our attendees who are here. Thank you very much, Daphne. Thank you for organizing this. And I'm very happy to be again in the uh, discussions of uh, public lectures of Anamed, which is also my uh, academic home. So uh, today we are going to be having a wonderful discussion with the two editors of, of this book, which uh, probably uh, many of you have seen, but I will be showing again it's the Byzantine Neighborhood, Urban Space and Political Action. And um, it is a book that came out from gradually through two main events. Uh, the first event uh, took place in 2015 in the Byzantine Studies Conference in uh, New York. And it was a panel, uh, the Archaeology of Byzantine Neighborhoods, uh, supported and sponsored by the Merit Jahari Center for Byzantine Art and Culture. And the second event was a colloquium that happened in 2015, 17, uh, uh, with the title The Byzantine Neighborhood, Urban Space and Political Action, hosted here the program of Byzantine Studies uh, at Dabardon Oaks. And later on, the uh, work from these two um, meetings uh, formed the core of uh, this book. Uh, it was, which was published 2022 uh, by Routledge in the series Birmingham Byzantine and Ottoman Studies, which happens also to be the alma mater, both for me and for Tini. So I will pass it on to our two um, speakers for a first overview with a slideshow of the sections and the content. And then we can go on with the discussion to you guys. Great, thank you, Nico. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen for a second. Um, so we can uh, share with you a little bit how we thought about, um, bear with me just a second, there we go. Um, so as Nikos uh, mentioned, you know, we started early on discussions about this need for having conversations about the Byzantine neighborhood. We explored these themes in two different conferences and with different speakers. Uh, and then we went into producing this um, volume that Ben and I will have an opportunity later in our discussion to say a little bit about how this came about and what such a volume with such an 
interesting but also difficult question uh, can be dealt with and developed. Uh, but first, let us take you through um, the content a little bit and the contributors, um, because I think it becomes very clear that we had some main questions we wanted to ask, but we also wanted to have different types of coverage, whether it was chronological or uh, different parts of Byzantium, different types of uh, evidence and material. And I will also say a little bit uh, variety in um, the contributors as far as where they are in their career right now, what universities they represent. Uh, ben? Do you want to comment something on that, on how we, we created this layout? Well, I mean, this is it, it, uh, nearly all of the papers that were delivered at those um, two different uh, meetings that Nikos mentioned um, at the beginning. And so the planning of this really began with the planning of those events. And we'd always planned them as complementary to each other. Um, I think that the idea had been suggested to Fotini some years previous that in order to propose a colloquium at Dumbarton Oaks, which is a fairly formal process, it would be best to do um, a slightly smaller event like a panel at the Byzantine Studies Conference first to explore the topic. Um, so when we were planning that particular um, panel, we already had in mind the notion that there would be an additional stage to this, whether hosted at Dumbarton Oaks um, or elsewhere. So there was a kind of a, a broad, um, outline that we had already. And I think, Fotini, that's, you've named the three, four major axes of diversity that we were looking to fill out, and obviously imperfectly. Um, but the chronology really trying to span from late antique to the very well studied, you know, late antique and transition, but also to include, in particular, I'd say in the case of uh, Nikos's contribution and also uh, Albrecht Berger and Leonora Neville's contributions, the later Byzantine city, which remains a less studied topic, we wanted to make sure that that was fully present here, if not uh, given equal weight. Um, ultimately, I think there's a little bit more weight on um, early and transitional period um, Byzantine evidence. We wanted to make sure that we had a geographic span um, that you know, included uh, the Near East in late antiquity, um, in addition to the Aegean Basin, to Anatolia, to the Balkans, um, as, and uh, in Crete, which plays um, I think Crete and Cyprus, which both play quite a large role um, in this volume. Um, and then in terms of um, the types of evidence um, that are engaged, we really wanted to have more um, reflective methodological essays, Fotini's essay and Albrecht Berger's essay, um, that approach the broader topic of how can you get at Byzantine neighborhoods via archaeology and via text, respectively, naturally on the basis of you know, specific evidence bases, but also posing the question more generally. It seemed to us important that we approach this both by reading, as we say in the introduction, the texts against the grain in order to find concepts of neighborhood that might not be immediately obvious, but also what it means to read the archaeological evidence against the grain in order to find, um, you know, elusive traces of neighborhood life, of these sort of social interactions that we're interested in. And then finally, and I think it's a super important um, point in terms of, the, that Fotini made in terms of the diversity of career stage, the scholars who we were engaging. Um, we are certainly not the first people to take on the topic of Byzantine neighborhoods. There's a really solid foundation in earlier scholarship. Um, and simultaneously, it seemed to us that by posing the question slightly differently of people who hadn't necessarily been directly engaging neighborhoods in their scholarship previously, there was an opportunity here to build on that earlier work and to present a picture which might in the end, and I think, in fact, I think is in the end, um, pretty different from the picture that we had of the Byzantine neighborhood previously. Yeah, and you know, I, I just want to say something more about the archaeological evidence that we had papers from people who are the directors of excavation, so they have first-hand knowledge of the material they're presenting. We had people who were revisiting um, older excavations and legacy data, or re-excavating parts of this, so bringing a very different understanding of sites that we think we know very well, but then when we pose questions like this, then they have to be uh, rethought and revisited. And then we also had more synthetic works of evidence that's already published, but published in a more 
descriptive way and now trying to bring them in a conversation that's much more theorized and wants to engage in a dialogue with everybody else. So, you know, I, I think that variety as well uh, is something that at least, you know, it made us very happy and I think it, it helps the conversation keep going and making the volume stand out. Um, if I may, I want to show you a little bit uh, some of the key uh, concept that we were asking our um, contributors to deal with. And when I'm saying asking, Nikos, as you, as you can see, is one of the contributors, so he can attest to this. I was this going to, to comment on how much the difference with other volumes, from my experience, was how you asked people to develop their thinking and to come and think not on something that they were uh, they were uh, researching, but something that they knew and they had to open up and develop their thing and go move forward and pose these questions. And that was a, a, a quite a process. So yeah, that was a long process. But you know, I want to I want to emphasize this to say two things. The first that although you know this did come from conversations and events that were conferences. I, I think, and you know, Ben can comment on that as well, that's very different from what we typically think as uh, conference proceedings, because these papers changed a lot from the moment they were presented. And uh, you know, we had asked all our contributors to read uh, certain ways that other scholars in, who are studying different cultures are dealing with such questions or so read outside the Byzantine world, because the Byzantine world this is something that everybody here knows very well. Um, but also, you know, we, at least Ben and I uh, enjoyed, you know, going back and forth with all the contributors, having discussions, thinking together about uh, the body of evidence, but also how to tackle some of the questions that were harder uh, to think about or in different ways that we've done before. So. I just want to say that, you know, on the one hand, we didn't lose any of our friends. Uh, all the contributors were willing to do the work. <laughs> this is great. Uh, but, you know, that changed how this volume was actually written and published at the end. That wasn't just, um, you know, off the conference and straight to publication. It had a lot of work. And I think for those of you who have read it or are about to read it, you'll see that it has the cohesion that sometimes, you know, uh, proceedings in conferences don't have. So let me just start by saying that one of the big challenges that we had to think about, all of us, and I think this is one of the most important things about the contribution of this volume, has to do with defining Byzantine neighborhoods. Because, and that was, and we received a lot of opposition about this, right? That if, if the Byzantines do not have an administrative term for this, then how can we talk about Byzantine neighborhoods? And then we were coming, all the contributors were coming to this with very flexible notions of what a Byzantine neighborhood was. And you know that makes certain people feel uncomfortable that there's not a little box where we can slide in all the factors and say, well, if you have A, B, and C, that is a neighborhood. So even challenging, that's you know, solid and unflexible, um, terms about what neighborhoods are was already inspirational for all of us that I think allowed us, freed us, if you like, to think a little bit more creatively and differently about how can we then talk about Byzantine neighborhoods and how can we define them in ways that make sense um, and is aligned with our textual and archaeological evidence, but brings new ideas and highlights new protagonist new situations within an urban setting. Ben? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the major findings of this book, especially when you put this material in conversation with work in Mesoamerica or in ancient Roman cities, um, is that there really is not an active administrative concept of neighborhood for the Byzantine state. So already when we're studying the Byzantine neighborhood, um, it's, it, it's not uh, uh, primarily uh, epiphenomenal to the state. It's actually something that we find elsewhere. Um, and finding it requires reading against the grain, reading the evidence against the grain. There will be cases, and we have texts that 
the Thotini and I discuss in our introduction and many of the contributors discuss in their chapters in which an author discusses Itunia. And this is a word that we can say in modern Greek as yeah, Byzantine Greek means something roughly like the English neighborhood. But actually, many of the most telling pieces of evidence are not and specifically invoking this terminology, but they're showing us a kind of um, intermediate scale social interaction that is immensely meaningful to the people who are involved in it, even if it doesn't have immediate salience at the administrative level. I think by intermediate scale, and this is one of the shared definitions that uh, united a lot of these contributions, if not all of these contributions, is something in between the level of the family and the state. So the neighborhood is something that sits intermediate between you know, the, the, the um, kinship structured um, social organization and the um, uh, much broader questions about Roman identity, about the identity of the Byzantines um, writ large, and insofar as it's promoted by um, you know, the, the Byzantine state. Um, and discovering that sort of intermediate thing, it's not something that's always been admitted um, in studies of Byzantine culture. There's a very famous book um, by Giles Constable and Alexander Kajdan on people in power um, in Byzantium, published in the 80s, also out of Dumbarton Oaks, um, in which they claim that like the, the Byzantine as such was naked and exposed to uh, state authority without any sort of intermediate level of protection, any intermediate level of community, basically. Um, and I think what we're able to do in this volume by reading these different kinds of evidence against the grain and admitting the existence of neighborhoods, even in the absence of the name, is discover precisely that intermediate level, this forms of uh, social support, um, the forms of mutual support, also antagonism and competition, obviously, um, that structured the daily lives of, um, uh, of most Byzantines. And it is then, by definition, a, a, a spatial phenomenon. Um, that ultimately, the neighborhood as it emerges for us um, is something that is enacted concretely in spaces that we can ascertain archaeologically. But that also means reading against the grain. We're not always looking at the big monumental constructions, the churches, the agare, like the sorts of um, things that you, you know, get a nice line drawn on a map, basically, of a city that it's very often a different set um, of uh, almost empty spaces between, alongside, outside of monumental constructions where we can see neighborhood taking shape. To me, they... and that, re that reminds me that, you know, some of the very ambitious goals that we had set uh, early on, even when we were um, dis discussing the conferences, uh, the one had to do with what, um, Ben was talking about, about that intermediate scale. And I say this because, you know, I, I, I want to take this opportunity in this discussion to say that such a volume is not relevant just for people who are dealing with material culture or just studies, um, urban phenomena in Byzantium. But, you know, one of the things that Ben and I were talk, were saying and really stuck to our, uh, to our guns on this was that in order to understand an empire in order to understand big and more abstract political uh, phenomena, you need to be able to move both from top to down and from the ground up. So that idea of neighborhood, because neighborhood for us meant some kind of spatial organization, but also some kind of social organization and political. I mean, that's why, you know, you can see that on the title that created that lifted, if you like, the veil of invisibility of these kinds of connections and interactions that are between the house, the family, the individual, and the state. Of course, there are others in there, but, you know, starting looking for those is a way to understand actually how larger political systems work. So our, one of our ambitions was, you know, how do we uh, show that neighborhoods can participate in bigger conversations about identity, about politics, about political phenomena, and more broadly about, you know, the, the idea of empire building, right? The other very ambitious goal that Ben and I had talked from the beginning was that, as many of you know, um, the city and 
urbanism in Byzantine studies is always something that's very uh, loved as a study, as a theme, and there are many publications and excellent works about the Byzantine city, whatever we think that it is. Oh, of course, uh, especially for late antiquity, a lot has been written for Constantinople and um, the Middle Byzantine city. But one thing that we don't see a lot, and you know, this is something that I learned as a fellow at Dumbarton Oaks, is that although we have so many studies on Byzantine urbanism, somehow our conversations do not participate in wider conversations about pre-modern urbanism, which is astonishing considering how much work we've all done collectively and how much evidence we have, both textual and archeological and uh, material. So for us, that was an opportunity then to you know, to engage with that conversation. That's why, and I say this because I want to explain that, uh, don't be surprised if you see a lot of footnotes and in the bibliography, uh, citations of works that come from uh, the ancient Greco-Roman world or from Mesoamerica that, you know, we had to look into these conversations to find a way to position ourselves and to, you know, find a way to speak across to colleagues who are doing is studying similar phenomena in pre-modern societies. So that was our second big goal. And uh, the other thing had to do with the flexibility that how can we, especially since we're still talking about definitions of neighborhoods, how do we come up with a definition for neighborhoods that allow that idea of neighborhood to change every time a different individual tell us the story of their neighborhood. Uh, so having that flexibility where all buildings, all phenomena, all social activities can or cannot be uh, factors that define what the neighborhood is and how that definition can change whether we're talking, uh, when, when we're looking at it from the perspective of elites, of non-elites, of women, of children, of men, and so on. So, you know, I think that comes by the participation of all the papers. I mean, Ben and I are kind of asking the question in the introduction, but if you want the answer of this, you need to go through all the um, all the chapters in the volume for this. For me, one of the most important things is what you both mentioned about bringing in the global experience. Uh, usually, uh, the Byzantium is victim of its testimonies, and we think that since they have so many texts, everything is there. And apart from that, all the rest, uh, you know, we don't need to, to look a little further. And then you have something that is self-evident, that exists in all societies around the world, which are neighborhoods, and suddenly you don't have it here in the text. So how do you tackle this, uh, this subject? To me, was uh, ingenious. How you bring the, the, the experience from other uh, fields and, you, and also the tools, the theoretical tools, that we need more and more to advance and also to go away from uh, Constantinople when we speak about neighborhoods to go to every, because it's something that existed in every settlement anywhere in the, in the empire. So that was a fascinating story. Say. Well, it's interesting that we do have papers about Constantinople in our volume. And the reason we have them is, uh, you know, obviously, you. It's, it's always going to be there. We don't want to ignore it, but we also want to test the waters and discuss Constantinople in relation to other cities, knowing what the difference the differences are. On the other hand, it's Constantinople, it's Constantinople that gets so much text uh, that allows us to explore that idea of flexible definitions. I mean, this is this is what Ben's paper does in, in such a brilliant way, allowing you to see also what matters, what the Byzantines themselves, without saying it, but actually acting upon it, how their actions and their social interactions define what the neighborhood is. Uh, I mean, you know, in Ben's paper, you can clearly see that it doesn't matter if the Byzantines don't have an administrative term for neighborhoods. These people know very well in what neighborhood they are and what are the social implications and implications for their identity, um, you know, are offered here. Uh, I, will, I will say though, just going back because then I wanna to move to the social and let me make, maybe just go to this already and say that, you know, the other challenge that 
um, Ben and I faced, and then we asked all our contributors to contributors to think uh, with us on this, was how to talk about neighborhoods without just making this a space of just daily life. Uh, you know, how do we talk about neighborhoods that it's not just about, you know, taking some water, moving around, um, doing chores, because we wanted to find a way to then arrive to the political interaction. So we wanted to highlight all the kind of activities that happen in the neighborhood, their social implications, but, with, but without creating this as, you know, a, a background that nothing really happens. It's like poor people and non-elites who just, you know, sit there and clean their vegetables and they're all together interacting. This is, so it's a little bit difficult to, it's, there's a danger there, uh, but we were very lucky with our contributors who came up with very interesting and different types of material to show us different places where these interactions happen, different ways, uh, different uh, built environments that afford such interactions. So I'm showing you here in the slide from our different contributors, how uh, looking at the bands at the side of the street next to an inn can be such uh, an important locale for the kind of definitions of neighborhood. Uh, a well that belongs to a church and a street again, or water uh, wells, reservoirs are places in the infrastructure of the city that get people together. And that was another, I think, very important thing that came up actually once, you know, we started um, reading the, contribu the contributions here that how aspects of urban infrastructure also not only define cities, not only make cities, but they create opportunities for social and political interactions in a way that I think we were aware, but not really saying it out loud and certainly not in publications. So highlighting that I think was, was a huge deal um, in the publication. Ben, what do you think about that? Well, I think that's really well put, Fotini. So we're looking here at, um, uh, so three images from three different chapters, three different um, case studies. Uh, and on the bottom there, that's from Beata uh, Bullendorf Arslan's essay on Asos. And as Fotini said, we're looking at a bench which is situated outside of a Xenodokion on a street. So a point where, um, once you start thinking about this in terms of neighborhood identity, people coming from outside, people who are by definition Xenos, foreign to the neighborhood, and um, encounter, have the opportunity to encounter the people who live in the adjoining um, residential district. So this is a great example of what we were talking about earlier, one of these sort of unassuming spaces if you're um, solely focused on monumental architectural typologies um, that are actually very potent when you start to think about the kinds of interactions that they can facilitate, the kinds of definitions of similarity and difference um, that they can generate. On the top left there, um, that's an example from the really great chapter um, by Amy Pap Alexandru, Bill Carraher, and um, R. Scott Moore, which is about um, the construction of a church in Polis, in Arsinoe, um, in Cyprus. So there we are dealing with one of the sort of major categories of monumental architectural typology, but their focus is much less on the sort of traditional architectural typological classification of this building, not even really on its liturgical use. I mean, the, the more familiar kinds of themes from architectural history, the way it's usually done, but instead the construction of this church as being a launch in construction and maintenance of this church as being a long-term locally rooted um, community activity um, that simultaneously again facilitates interaction with people who are coming from outside of the neighborhood. In this case, um, you know, we have evidence about uh, pilgrimage to the churches of Arsinoe that are collected alongside. So again, this is a, a meeting place between um, a very clearly defined local community um, and visitors who get to come in and experience this from outside. Um, and then finally, the top right there, we're looking at, um, you know, that may be familiar to people. That's the um, 
reservoir that's built in the 6th century uh, alongside the uh, Agora in Thessaloniki. And this is from uh, Jordan Pickett's contribution to the volume, which is one of the um, contributions that, as Fotini was mentioning, we have both the people who are like the, the directors and the active excavators of these sites, and that's the case here with Assos and with uh, Polis. Um, in the case of Jordan's essay, he's comparing a lot of published archaeological data from a number of different sites, including Ephesus, Jerash, um, uh, Betjan, Eskathopolis, and um, Caesarea, and uh, in this case, Thessaloniki. Um, and what he's able to show in comparing these, I mean, this is a story that we're all familiar with, is the, 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 the end of the aqueducts, basically, as being a kind of... Um, solid terminus to the uh, ancient city, the Roman city. But the question of what comes after and what replaces these really large scale engineering projects that are bringing uh, arterial water from outside long distances outside of cities in order to feed baths and um, other sort of gymnasia, these sort of you know, really yeah, nymphaea, these you know, major engineering works of the Roman state. Instead, you get what Jordan Pickman, the essay describes as a much more diversified portfolio of different means of access to water at different scales. Thessaloniki is an especially interesting example because in Thessaloniki, you actually do have maintenance of the aqueducts for much longer than we have um, in other sites. But simultaneously and alongside that, that's not sufficient, that there are these other forms of collection reservoirs in particular um, that are assuming a new importance when we move into the late antique and Byzantine city. So that tells us something that the, these are filling needs um, at a sort of a, a local organizational level of the neighborhood that the large scale state projects weren't actually fulfilling. So in all of these cases, you're dealing with something that could be fairly easily slotted into a standard um, you know, architectural typology, but approaching it from this perspective of the neighborhood causes us to look at these spaces differently and suddenly see them as sites, um, you know, not just of, of construction, but also active sites of identity formation within the cities. I think, you know, especially the, the chapters that, you know, brought that conversation of infrastructure uh, into their, their research, in a way paved um, the way for the last section, which I will say it was the hardest, I think, for all of us to think together and conceptualize. And, um, you know, we called upon the expertise of Nikos, uh, of Christina Tsigonaki uh, from her work in Crete, and of course, Leonora Neville, who thinks a lot about administration in the regions and in the local level to help us think this. I will say, and I will reveal this for everybody who is tuning in, that this was the hardest to write for our contributors. And I, you know, I'll, I'll finish the sentence and then I'm going to ask Nikos to talk about this. But I will say that for a long time, what Ben and I were reading was all the perfect evidence and discussions we were hoping that they would offer. And they were still thinking, okay, I, these are all my evidence. What is political about it? And this is something we all had to think very hard together. Uh, because I think for a lot of us, you know, this idea of political action, uh, we associate that with something that's very powerful and long lasting, whether it's a civil war or a riot, and it has that element of violence. So in a way, that's why I was saying that thinking about the infrastructure and the changes that we're seeing in the course of the Byzantine city, the fact that the administration, as Leonora has written about this repeatedly, becomes a little bit hands off. That is what allows other uh, agents to take action and take political action. If you are making decisions about water in the city, that is a political action. You don't have to riot for this to be a political action. That already is a political action. So, you know, finding these locations, where would these people need to have these conversations even, right? So that was the previous section. And now the task was, okay, show us more clearly how then this social interaction, this face-to-face -face interaction, these discussions these people are having and the decisions they're making, how can we think them as political? Nico, how was your experience in thinking about this? I can only say it was a revelation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I have to say that uh, this is one of the few things that I wrote so many times after the PhD. And, um, but uh, trying to understand the collective initiatives and trying to look through the evidence and um, see the people and that they are not passive. That's, that, that was for me, uh, suddenly uh, along, somewhere in the third or fourth draft, things were starting falling into place and they're uh, much nicer. And I was saying, I've read it so many times, why haven't I seen it before? Um, and many things that uh, you already know and texts that are already there and they are usually seen under another viewpoint, like uh, the, uh, the confraternity of thieves, it's always about uh, uh, veneration and being all together uh, worshipping uh, an icon and suddenly when you put it into a special context and when you try to see it within the landscape, the actual landscape, not cut off and uh, or a document that is cut off and seen uh, away from the place where it was supposed to function, but within the community and within the space also means how would they, these people, they, they, they speak about processions, how this would happen, how they would, which are the streets they would pass from, where are they going from one place to another, and suddenly the things that they were saying within the document found another dimension in my mind, and that was for me um, one of the things for which I'm grateful. I started seeing things a little way, and I was saying, yes, they are speaking about helping each other, but helping each other is not only as good Christians, it also has to do helping in times of uh, difficulty, supporting each other, having these networks of uh, um, relationships that in the end can be seen as political, economical, uh, um, and uh, social. So in the end, under the words that you, uh, and under the terms that they are using, you see all the other layers that were always there. That was for me uh, the astonishing thing that I understood for a material that I thought I knew and was always there. Um, at least for this. Uh, ben, how was yours from a contributor's point of view for your chapter? Well, I mean, I, I really enjoyed writing this paper. So, I mean, again, to say that what we have on the screen here are the image of the, the tower that's um, in uh, in Thebes and Nikos's uh, contribution. Um, and then the map of Crete, including the two very different um, cities that Christina Tsiwanaki compares in, in her contribution, Gortin, a really major, large, monumental um, city, and Eleftherna, a much smaller, much more remote um, site. Um, and then finally, we have there top left um, is a sort of an image that I've drawn a notional plan of the neighborhood that is described um, in a set of texts very well known to Byzantinists, the Miracles of Artemius, um, set in the early 7th century and in a very specific neighborhood um, in Constantinople um, known as the Oxia um, after this sort of um, height or, or eminence um, that it's situated on. Um, so for me, this was, um, you know, an incredibly interesting exercise to read a text spatially and to try and understand it's exactly like what Nikos was saying. I mean, that resonated very strongly for me. If you suddenly take the toponyms, the very concrete spatial um, indications that we get in sources and try and hear the resonance that that has, even if we're no longer able to stand on just that street corner and see the things that you would see if and the people that you would see if you were there, to try to understand it as rooted in a very specific space that shapes the social interactions that take place there and that and also reciprocally causes the reshaping um, of that space via those social actions that um, something really comes alive, that there's a kind of dynamism, sources that we might have been accustomed to go to in order to establish what's totally necessary, just like the location of a particular named monument. And once you then sort of fill them with the kinds of social interactions that, for example, hagiographical hey, texts um, do, um, that again, 
um, you know, they acquire a vibrancy and they acquire an excitement, um, which is in, a tantamount to, uh, like Nikos was saying, reading them, you know, totally anew and basically understanding them and um, totally anew. So I really love this challenge. So what's political about the miracles of Artemis, right? The miracles of Artemis is mostly about, um, you know, a saint who from beyond the grave cures hernia. And that's very important, right? Yeah, it's very important to all the people whose experiences are described there. But it's also simultaneously about a community that has a really strong sense of local identity that is specific to the Oxia. I mean, these are also people who live in Constantinople. They know people who live in other neighborhoods in Constantinople. Other people from other neighborhoods come and visit them, especially if they need hernia to be cured um, from elsewhere. Um, but um, there is simultaneously um, the, the sort of the workings of a local organization, which I try to show, it exists alongside, outside of the state, and is even capable in certain circumstances of sort of using state institutions like the urban prefecture instrumentally to meet its own goals. So precisely to the other um, part of Nikos's point, this is about suddenly the, the residents of these neighborhoods becoming active acting in a kind of self-interest, identifying a collective self-interest at the level of the neighborhood, which is not necessarily in opposition to the state. So politics doesn't have to be this kind of dichotomy of support of or opposition to the state, right? Um, sort of complacency or revolt. There's a kind of intelligence in the way in which they use the tools and the institutions of the state to meet their own interests and to um, you know, reproduce their own kinds of local identities um, and uh, collectivities. Um, so yeah, I, I love this section. <laughs> I, I, I will say that, you know, at the end, I think here with with these three papers um, at the end, I think this is where we manage as, as a collective ourselves to, to expand the notion of political. I want to go back to what I said before, that this is not just a volume for people who are dealing with urbanism or material culture, but it really dives in into more um, a different kind of approach to how we think about more abstract uh, institutions. And here, the fact that we were able to expand, you know, notions of what political political agency, political action means in Byzantium uh, through the lens of neighborhood. On the one hand, you know, kind of stopping and interrupting this business of dichotomy. It's either everybody get a, gets along and supports the state or they're rioting. Uh, and on the other hand, so, you know, to show that flexibility that all of these things can happen simultaneously and communities and people can align or not align with the state um, in different times to support their own goals. And the other one had to do with what you, what Nicholas was saying about this idea of passive, that even for structures, buildings, phenomena, such as I'm, I'm looking in my screen, the Tower of Thebes, that we associate with political power that only is one way, it's coming from the one side, but it, uh, Nikos and Christina both discuss how even such structures do create um, responses that also have political implications, whether that authority is accepted, whether other um, spaces in the city are used for people to meet in opposition to who is meeting in these towers and so on. So that kind of variety, I think, really managed to show us, to invite us to think in a very, very diff in different ways, plural, about what political action is. And I think, you know, I would love to see in the future more people following that uh, rationale and thinking more about, you know, the material they know very, very well, and they consider them as nothing to do with uh, the political foundation of Byzantium, thinking them through that lens and saying, okay, I have these people, I have these monuments, I have this material. What are the political dimensions here? Because I think it's by asking this question that we can really, really understand better and deeper how Byzantium uh, works. And, oh. uh, you know, Nico, you wanted something? I wanted to say also, it's not only in the, in a, in a, what was for me interesting in to see how people react in when things are changing 
when disasters are happening for their life, when new players are coming, how these people in every neighborhood, in every city are reacting and they try to preserve their, their way of life. So in all excavations, you see some parts that are being deserted, people leaving from here, going there. Um, you have refugee, uh, refugees who are going. And to this, it was so, for me so interesting to see our experience today with all the uh, refugee waves, how when they go into a city, where do they stay? Refugees are always going together. They, go, they, they even move uh, to other waves of previous refugees from their own cities and they stay together, usually not at the same city centers. They usually go to um, outside at the peripheries of cities. And they are, there are so many uh, modern notions that we see around us that we need to understand that we're there also in the Byzantine city. And that was so for me interesting. When you try to recreate how these people, when in times of disaster, in times of or, or the, or the contrary, in times where everything was going well and they expand. So some people decide to move outside of the walls and populate other areas. How this is, these are also um, initiatives that uh, uh, want the people of these neighborhoods to act uh, very energetically. And that was, for me, uh, interesting in this yeah, you're, you're also raising a very um, other important aspect here that has to do with movement. Movement of people who are coming in and out cities assume different roles. Uh, they're newcomers or they're the established people who are living the city. And that was also something that a lot of us has had to think about, again, in creating these very flexible images of what a neighborhood is, right? Because this is something that um, you discussed, Nikos, in your paper, um, but also with the in. Um, issues of pilgrimage that we heard Ben discuss in relation to Amy's paper. Um, for me, what I see in the Agora, in the Athenian Agora is the same. We have a lot of changes, which means that we have populations coming in and out of the, uh, of the city and building and reconfiguring ways to think about uh, neighborhoods. And I think, you know, that, uh, I want to share that last image I have, because I think that brings us to this point that if we, if we don't move forward in this way, where we try to reimagine, repopulate these cities, understand them as constantly changing and be okay with that in the scholarship, we will end up with frozen cities. And I mean, this is an incredible uh, illustration of what the frozen city is, but we will never uh, really fully understand um, we'll start talking about what the multiple and different urban experiences could be and really highlight everyone involved, which is never only the state and never only the people. And I think, you know, we all in our individual chapters try to find ways and discuss ways where we can do that with very different material. Um, and, you know, we all, I mean, if you read, there is no, I was doing a search, um, a word search last night, there is no chapter that doesn't use the word interaction and community. And that says a lot uh, about what we imagine um, and what we've tried to achieve in this um, book. Ben? I mean, I think what this image really shows us, this is from the, the Para Museum exhibit, isn't it? That Amir yes. Alishik uh, curated on popular culture receptions of, of Byzantium. And it's amazing because it serves as kind of a reductio ad absurdum for the way that we are conventionally accustomed to graphically represent ancient cities, right? You need a plan and the plan is going to have heavy black lines on it that indicate the things that are worth studying within that city. And then between those big monumental constructions, this big multi-domed church here, 
and the sort of dam, I mean, these major kind of engineering works, it's a wasteland, it's frozen. Like any blank spot is by definition devoid of life, devoid of activity. I mean, nobody actually thinks that that's the way that cities work, but it becomes an image that's almost subconsciously set in our mind by the ways in which we're accustomed to graphically representing um, ancient cities, and whether we're getting at them through the texts or whether we're getting at them um, through the architecture archaeology. So, I mean, this is also a wonderful sort of closing challenge um, to say, okay, how would we create a fantasy Byzantine city that is, you know, the opposite of this? What is the image that we would create after having gone through this volume that showed a you know, Byzantine city totally inhabited, totally functioning? Could it be a fixed image? Would it have to be a moving image, actually, in order to convey the various textures um, that we're getting at. But it's also simultaneously just a challenge, I think, that whenever we look at these urban plans, and our basis for our study is always going to be urban plans, to remember them as something provisional, something heuristic. They're not fixed. They're attempts to capture something that's by its very definition in flux, in motion, ephemeral. Um, and once we sort of you know, are able to remind ourselves of that, again, the, the, the plan comes alive in a way that's very exciting. Yeah, I, I like that. And, you know, I mean, at the same time, you know, we don't want to imply, I, I think we mentioned this in the beginning, and it's important to, to say this again, that we're the first people to say these things. Um, I mean, we're step, stepping in the, in the work of um, other incredible scholars and their work who, you know, advocate for this kind of approach to city making. Um, but, you know, the neighborhood lens, I think, was missing a lot. Uh, and also that I, I still feel that despite this conversation, this is not still in the mainstream of how we talk about Byzantine cities, especially for people who are not directly engaged in the study of this. Uh, so that is what I think drove Ben and I to start having these conversa conversations because we wanted more of those and we wanted opportunities to drive that point home that we need to be okay with this idea that they're not frozen, everything is moving, all these definitions are flexible, and now that we've checked that box, let's go out there and find these urban experiences and give a voice uh, to different people and how they even think about their own neighborhood uh, in a very way, in the very way that, you know, we think very differently about modern neighborhoods and our experiences and attachments with special, uh, with specific locales. Uh, not that modern experiences necessarily translate to Byzantine or pre-modern, but uh, it is another starting point for us to, I think we understand and accept that flexibility for our own lives, but we rarely um, extend that courtesy to the pre-modern world. And that creates bigger questions about how we think uh, about the past, how we position ourselves in a more um, historical perspective. So I was going to ask you, what is, you know, what is the next step? Okay, what just, just stop then? sharing for a moment. No, stop. <laughs> we do love that think? image, but. So I also believe that this is opens the discussion and we need to continue with this discussion on, on neighborhoods and where it will lead us, not only on how they change, on what, what do they do? What do you do in a neighborhood? What are the different forms that you can have? But, um, do you see the next steps leading, missing points, missing links that we would like to, you, you would like to have seen something more or people to go on? Um, I think I'm gonna start since Ben is nodding. And I will say, I will say two things. The, the first thing, and I will, uh, I will speak from an archeological point of view, you know, we don't uh, order the kind of data that we're gonna find. So in every excavation, I mean, what, what I'm trying to say here is just because we have a couple um, uh, a couple of colleagues showing their work in this volume doesn't mean that now we've figured out everything and we presented all the data. So the more colleagues who can show us data from their excavation, features that they've discovered, that they think that, you know, this, these are great ways to think and expand this idea of neighborhood, that will always be welcome. Right, to, to, to allow us to see more material 
as pathways which we can follow to come to these conversations. I would like to see more personally, uh, the historians engaging more with this kind of approaches, um, you know, allowing conversations to happen simultaneously that start from an empire uh, uh, starting point, but also for something a little bit more smaller scale as we uh, offer here in the neighborhoods. The final thing I wanna say from my point of view is that the whole time that Ben and I were editing and preparing the volume, the one thing that we were missing and it felt like the elephant in the room was this kind of approaches, this kind of theoretical approaches to also the house. Because we started, we have a lot of the cities. We said, okay, let's tackle the neighborhood. Where are the publications for the Byzantine house that are not just typolo typologies, that are not just about uh, construction, building material, all of this stuff is very important and they create a foundation. But how do we move from that to thinking about the house as a social space, as a political space? So that was always missing. I mean, it was missing for us as we were writing this, that we didn't have the right or what we needed as citations. We had a lot of work from colleagues uh, and our own work, but nothing that was really engaging in these questions. So for me, that was that is certainly a task I've set for myself and with other colleagues for the future to then produce a very similar minded volume on the Byzantine house that theorizes more and asks very similar questions about social and political action. So that's the one. Ben? No, I totally agree with with everything that you just said, Fatine. I mean, I think in addition to that, and it's one thing that we draw attention to in the uh, in the introduction. And and I should say, I mean, we we sent a lot of comments to the contributors, but also simultaneously, our introduction was taking shape and changing and responding to the sorts of materials that the uh, the contributors were sending in. So this was the sort of mutually enriching process. And of course, Fatine are also both contributors to the volume in addition to being the editor. So I mean, this was a really collaborative kind of thing. One thing that we point out um, in the introduction is this necessity for more archaeologically informed studies of the late Byzantine city. There is a really kind of, you know, broad sense in which um, we know the early Byzantine city, the transitional period, maybe increasingly also the middle Byzantine city, as much as an archaeological phenomenon as we do as a textual phenomenon, but most comprehensive studies of the late Byzantine city are still primarily anchored, I think, in text. Nikos's contribution to this volume is, you know, a really great exception to that. Um, but, you know, there's a wonderful essay that um, Potini um, drew our attention to uh, that appeared a few years ago in the Scandinavian Journal of Byzantine Studies by Yanis Smarnakis um, about the Zealots' revolt in Thessaloniki that understands this, um, you know, textually attested um, phenomenon in its spatial context and the very sense of the very concrete neighborhoods that are siding one with the, um, you know, one party and one with the other in the broader context um, of the Zealots' revolt. And I think that there's a lot more work um, that can be done, especially with not setting aside the sources, but putting these late Byzantine sources, which are so informative um, about sort of local organization, community formation, um, into dialogue with the spatial and the archaeological evidence. Um, and the other thing that strikes me is that, um, it, you know, there's more to be learned from small finds, what we often call um, small finds in terms of community organization. And, um, you know, I think that uh, the notions that Fotini explores in her contribution about were there neighborhoods of craftspeople, were there neighborhoods um, within Byzantine cities that were defined, at least in part, um, as the site where a particular craft is cultivated. Again, this comes up in, uh, in Nikos' contribution as well, looking at Thebes and Kalkis. So it's not just a question of, um, you know, one way to, to sort of give life to these intermediate spaces that are the blanks on the plan um, is by means of the small finds. But that's not, um, you know, something that as archaeologists were necessarily trained to do. 
to understand small finds, not just as kind of contributing to a chronology or a typology for a given site, but also as telling us about a very specific kind of localized social activity um, within the, uh, the cities that we're studying. So I think more um, creative use of ceramic evidence, of numismatic evidence in a sort of a, a neighborhood focused uh, investigation could be quite rewarding. Mm -hmm. And I think you are um, answering uh, indirectly one of the questions we have on our chat. Uh, uh, Scott Coleman, who uh, asks about uh, how the approach is to work on coin circulation in the neighborhood. And I'm intrigued about how lay people may have issued coins to help create communal identities or something. So, how may have used, not issued, coins to, for uh, communal identities. So, the really the material culture of every neighborhood, of every large uh, complex, tells us uh, not only about the objects, but also about the, the, you know, the identity of the people and how they pursue themselves. I, 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 will, I will say here that, you know, there is um, there's a long way ahead. And I should say this in terms of it is it is important to know what questions we want to ask, but then going back to our data, we have to rethink the way we approach the data in order to arrive there. So I'm gonna use COIN since it's mentioning the questions as a good example for that, that um, we cannot start talking with COINs about localized events and identity and neighborhoods until we know for each excavation, what is going on with these coins in terms of their deposition, uh, taphonomy, uh, how they arrive to the excavation. At the moment we find them, and I will say that, for example, almost none of the coins found in the Agora is in situ, is not in its first deposition. Uh, and it's indicative that in the same layer, you have middle bees, uh, early Roman uh, classical period. So you have to decide first how to encounter and deal with these assemblages that not only have coins, but have other finds as well. And they are a group. So there's that part. And then, you know, we need to be in, in, in better uh, communication with our colleagues who, who do specialize in, in specific objects such as coins to better understand circulation and how long certain coins um, are being used and why. Because this, when we figure out that, that gives us already a window about neighborhoods, about urban identity, about localized identity. But we need that prep in order to arrive to that point. I mean, and, and I will say as someone who deals with these questions every day in the Agora, this is not ready material. It's not out there ready for you to just get it and move here. There is a process that needs to happen. And that is with very serious methodological implications that have to be understood. Uh, and the other thing I wanna say is that, you know, as archeologists, it's our job to make this understood for everybody else who is not dealing with archeological material, but would like to use uh, archeological material in their own thinking about all these questions that we are thinking about. So think about our colleagues who for decades have drilled in, in our head how to reach sources. The archaeologists haven't had same success in explaining how archaeological data should be used. Um, so yes, we want more of these coins, pottery, finding a place in that story but we also want to make sure that's the right way that they find their place in, in our stories. And Nico suffers from the same things as well. So I, I, you know what I'm talking about. Just because before I pass it to, to Ben, just also to show that coins many times is not only the value, but also the symbol. So many times you see them being used uh, and especially uh, as, um, indicators, identifiers, and that's so the, a very interesting uh, case because usually next to neighborhoods there are also little churches and they have the cemeteries and then you find also the objects which are no more a coin as a value. Mm -hmm. 
to buy something, but it's a coin as a value to indicate your identity. So, Ben, if you don't want to, I've got another question. So, to, sorry, I, so have we, so that everybody who is in the webinar, so have we now moved to answering questions from everybody yes. who's in? Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I should have said it. So now we are uh, answering some of the Q&A questions and feel free please to uh, fill in and uh, ask whatever you would like. Uh, one other uh, question for Maria Xanto, she's uh, saying uh, that uh, we mentioned that uh, um, the social may, that the neighborhoods may as uh, social units may be disrupted due to natural or man-made hazards, but may also continue to exist beyond topological disruption, that is dislocation, in terms of an ethnonymic or a dislocated or a dislocated community. Also in cities like Thessalonica, where we have a change from Byzantine to Ottoman rule, may we trace certain social patterns in the creation or preservation of neighborhoods, which I think it's a very interesting case idea. So. No, it's a it's a fantastic question, um, and it's one that I'd say multiple contributors to the volume address directly. Um, so uh, the question of the transitions in rule is the most obvious one, and the you know it's there explicitly in the question. So do neighborhoods survive after the end or the change of a, a state or a regime? Um, and this is something that Nikos addresses directly looking at uh, Thebes and Chalkis and the transition from um, you know, Byzantine uh, into uh, Frankish, Catalan, Venetian um, rule in the later Byzantine um, period. And it's also something, and so there, I think that uh, Nikos is really able to show that these neighborhoods do survive. And in fact, they're one of the um, primary um, engines of resilience um, in these particular communities that they um, recognize at a certain point um, their own interests as being greater than those of allegiance to a particular state, that this kind of um, you know, promotion of the local economic prosperity is more important than maintaining allegiance to a particular state. And after having recognized this, are able to um, you know, sort of reproduce um, these kinds of community um, even after the change of rule. Um, what seems like a really interesting counterexample, which is discussed by Albrecht Berger and his uh, contribution is Constantinople. Um, and uh, it really does not seem that the Mahala of, um, let's say, 16th century uh, Istanbul, the neighborhood formation that gets institutionalized in Istanbul, um, is uh, a direct um, continuation of the neighborhoods of the late Byzantine period. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of evidence um, for the really serious disruption of uh, neighborhood communities in Constantinople in the 1450s. Um, it's the really interesting survey of Constantinople um, that was discussed in Venice by uh, Nevra Najipolu and her plenary address um, that was published by uh, Hildil Analjic several uh, years ago, but that really shows an addition to, you know, giving it a very interesting kind of inventory of the, the physical remains of the Byzantine neighborhoods. It also shows these neighborhoods as being totally vacated, basically. Um, you know, everybody's moved. You have entirely new um, communities that have been resettled in neighborhoods that were basically vacated um, five or 10 years previous. So th there's examples of both where we have Byzantine neighborhoods that um, survive after Byzantium, and we have Byzantine in cities where the end of Byzantine rule seems to basically mean the end of the Byzantine neighborhood as such. Of course, other neighborhoods emerge, but they're not necessarily um, uh, directly descended from the, the previous the Byzantine neighborhoods. And I think it's, it's also important to remember that resilience does not mean stability. And this is something that Maria hints also now in her question, but I think it's important to say this, that this is not a measure of re resilience. Uh, resilience mean being able to adapt to change and even produce something new. Therefore, even in certain um, occasions, moving neighborhoods, changing neighborhoods, not coming back to what was before is also a way to think about resilience. Uh, and this is something that 
you know, Nikos argues very well, but all uh, in thinking that, okay, when we have political change, these people, the first thing that they want is to survive and, you know, play a game that will allow them to continue with their economic activities and their uh, social activities that can or cannot be anchored in specific locations. The locations can also change uh, without that social network changing so, um, so deeply. And, you know, um, Christina shows that a little bit in a very different way of political change when, you know, the state makes, becomes more visible insights increase and in Crete and other times when it's not or in other locations where it's not and what happens to these neighborhoods as well. Uh, neighborhoods as well. Well, and I see the same in Athens when, you know, I, I look at the evidence before and after 12 or 4 and what happens when Athens uh, is under Frankish political control. There is not direct, um, there is no abandonment, but also something changes in, in, in the, um, what these neighborhoods are doing. So it's, it's that, that, that's a, a much more complex question about, A, how we define resilience and what we think the evidence can be, um, and then how that's played out in a neighborhood location. But I love that question. That's a great question. So, you know, in a way, Maria um, gives us a, a new direction to think uh, in the terms of both uh, catastrophe, environmental uh, challenges, but also this idea of what, what resilience looks like in, in neighborhoods as both social and political environments. Yeah, thanks. And to, to me, it's also just uh, uh, to add that it's also their own initiatives. They have, uh, they, they also have to participate in any discussion and in any decision that is happening. Even when you have a whole city being relocated, I, for the first time, I had to think: What does it mean, relocation? How is it done? You don't just take the people like that and you move them. They all have to participate and be persuaded and, you know, discuss it. And somehow they have their own mechanisms of adapting to the new situation. So I and, found... And, and, and the other way around, right? You can relocate, relocate to force the hand of the administration to do something about it. Obviously, the, the, the administration is somewhere away. To take yeah. a decision, it means that you have to push it. You have the channels of communication. The decisions usually start from the bottom. There is a need and someone is reacting to it. So I found it so interesting. So can I ask you, if we, if we were starting differently, this book, what would you do? What would you change? I don't, I start, I do the first for the Byzantine house and then come to neighborhoods, perhaps? I, I, I think I, <laughs> I'm trying to say it in a way that's polite and appropriate. <laughs> um, look, I mean, it, it took us a while to get there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I will let Ben answer his own thoughts, but I didn't, I didn't think that, you know, we were that we would encounter so much opposition in these discussions in, you know, we had colleagues who were rightly asking, why do we need a conversation of neighborhoods? And we had also colleagues who uh, were sharing their concerns that, well, if the Byzantines didn't think about neighborhoods in an administrative way, why, why bother asking anything? It's not, it's not a thing. Uh, so, you know, I think we weren't prepared for that. And somehow very innocently, we thought we would get this, that quicker, which you know, it didn't happen. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I learned a lot in the process. Um, we now know better how to do certain things. So hopefully in the future that will um, make life easier for us. But what, what I will not um, regret uh, was giving all of us a lot of homework uh, and enjoying that discussion <laughs> that it might delay the the final publication, but I think it was very valuable for us as the editors to have to set out the time to speak with all the contributors and think through, um, you guys helped us form uh, the framework and the introduction 
and you know Ben and I can only hope that our comments and our edits and our discussions on the phone through time zones and in different countries and continents kind of help you clarify the incredible material you all brought to the table. So you know that, that's the one thing I don't regret. But we could, we could, I I could have hoped that we could have done it a little bit faster. I mean, we started 2015 and we're 2022. So hey, you know, one can dream. I don't know, Ben. What do you think? Yeah, I honestly can't think of anything. I think that the book took like exactly the amount of time that it was meant to take in terms of, and especially when I think of the change in, in our framing, Fotini, from our initial proposals for grants and for, you know, you know support from Dunbar Noakes and so forth, the texts that we'd written that in some way then evolved into what's now the introduction. Um, but there's very little left of the original material. It's almost fully evolved into something new. And that couldn't have happened if we hadn't had these, you know, you know many individual and group conversations with the various collaborators and contributors um, that you're mentioning. I mean, I guess I could wish for it to be a longer book. I can think <laughs> of other chapters that I'd love to you know, yeah. see included in here. But of course, if it were a longer book, it also would have taken a longer time. And there's also an importance, I think, in a certain point, letting go of this topic, not that we're going to stop working on it, but it is equally an invitation to say, here's what we were able to make um, of the material that we found and invite other people. Um, and I hope that includes Byzantinists. I hope that includes, as Fotini is saying, historians, archaeologists, scholars of literature, scholars of art, um, and I also hope that we are able to engage, um, you know, not just via the footnotes with colleagues in other disciplines who are working in similar um, topics, but also via different kinds of, you know, further conversation. So, you know, it would be interesting, would the book be, um, another question we could ask is if we had a contribution by somebody who was writing about neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. in the year 2022, right? Um, you know, would it open up a broader conversation, um, you know, also about the sort of implicitness of our, our own scholarship, how our own um, both tacit and explicit ideas of neighborhood then um, shape the way that we work on the material from the past and whether the material from the past should reshape the way that we approach um, you know, neighborhoods um, and their histories uh, today. That would be a really interesting conversation to open up, but I still have hope that that can happen, you know, down the road through events like this. And, you know, especially hopefully by people just taking the book, reading it, criticizing it, tearing it apart, building it all up again in some other different form. Um, you know, that would be super. Mm -hmm. Yeah, publishing more to show us that, you know, there was a better way of doing it, absolutely. Uh, I will say though, you know, um, it all worked out in a way that, um, for me, it really bolstered my view that we need more on the house as well. I think, you know, I kind of knew it because of the work I do and what I think, you know, I need in terms of collaboration with other colleagues and their input and their um, perspectives. But after having done this, uh, this really made it very clear to me what else is needed and how easier it would have been to write and think through some of these questions if we had a similar volume for the Byzantine house. So, you know, it, it really showed me that we're not crazy and, you know, this is needed and um, we'll move forward with that too, in a way. Yeah. One last comment I will ask you. We have a, a last a very interesting question by Julie Petet about uh, the baths. And did the baths have a role in giving definition to a neighborhood? Would you consider baths part of the infrastructure? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, baths uh, obviously come up in multiple uh, contributions to the volume. They're very important, um, you know, um, in, in Jordan Pickett's volume. Baths necessarily imply a form of um, uh, water management and the ways in which that changes um, as we move through the sort of millennium long histories of various Byzantine cities um, is totally fascinating. I mean, I really see it in uh, the miracles of Artemis. Um, so the baths are in a sense as important as the churches when you look at the places in um, 
you know, these stories that a kind of neighborhood identity is formed. It's really interesting because so th these men, some of whom are suffering from fairly grisly um, injuries, um, are many of them ashamed to go to the bath in their own neighborhood and to expose themselves to their neighbors um, and instead make a habit of going far away to the other side of the city to use different baths. I think that's a really kind of um, potent indicator of the function of baths in, um, uh, you know, informing, infusing aspects of individual identity within um, the Byzantine neighborhoods. And I do think that that's, you know, when Fotini is then pointing to the importance of the house, it speaks to the broader set of issues that we're getting at here, which I think have to do with, you know, subject formation, ultimately, right? Something that we're very well informed with now via studies, for example, of the liturgy um, or of um, uh, the contact of Romanos and the ways in which I'm thinking in Derek Kruger's work that he's able to show this as, you know, forming um, you know, specific subjects. Um, the house as a scene of this, the bath as the scene of this, in addition to the church as the scene of this. And in fact, how all of these things work together um, in order to form very distinct senses of, of personal identity of selfhood. Um, I think this kind of spatial approach has a tremendous amount to contribute to those uh, conversations. And I hope we're able to indicate a little bit um, in this volume of how that might work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I feel fully covered. And, you know, we, we started, I just want to say this for everybody that um, we started with very simple questions, like let's, let's find some of these spaces where people do meet on a daily basis or frequently. And it, it, even if, you know, if we only stick to this idea of um, political action as riot, where does one meet somebody else to convince them to side with them, right? So, you know, really just naming out loud places, spaces, areas, and buildings within the city that such interaction can happen where um, these people can meet. So obviously baths were, high in, in our list. And the other thing is when these things involve decision-making, uh, because a lot of this infrastructure changes um, in the history of the cities and different groups manage them, or when the state leaves it alone, local groups manage them. So then, you know, these, these groups then have a social identity, have a communal identity, and they do assume the role of the state because they manage parts of the infrastructure, not just for their own personal use, but for others, either by allowing them access or refusing access, or especially when it comes to water, reorienting the flow of water and so on. So things like baths um, or wells, as, since we're in the water situation, allows us to see both them as locations of social interaction, but what kind of uh, affordances they allow for political decision making. So, yeah. Wonderful. I don't think I have something to add. I would like just to thank you again for the for today, for this talk. I would like to thank all of you for all the viewers for being here. And uh, I'm uh, just uh, asking you to read it tear it apart and move onwards with further research on this wonderful subject. So thank you very much for today. Thank you also Daphne and Anna Med for organizing this. Thank you so much for hosting us. Thank you for inviting us and Nikos, thank you for also uh, coming to join the conversation uh, with us. And I want to say to people who are reading the book or intend to read it, drop us a line. Tell us what you thought. We want to hear Perfect. Thank you very much, Joel, for this wonderful talk. Um, this book uh, and this discussion really showed us um, how it is possible to go uh, beyond conference proceedings. And we hope that this publication will start further discussions about um, Byzantine neighborhoods. Um, so, uh, dear attendees, thank you very much for your questions. If you want to rewatch this uh, talk, or share it, uh, you may soon uh, access this talk on Animate Library's YouTube and SoundCloud accounts.
And dear Fatine, Benjamin and Nikos, thank you very much once more. And um, goodbye to everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye.